Good. Okay. Hello, everyone. Thanks for being here. Uh, my name is Fadi Mali. Uh, I'm a BHE student at Derry. Uh, so today I'll be speaking about um, RDF analytics, so doing data analytics on top of RDF. Uh, to start with some motivation, you probably have heard uh, uh, many recent quotes about how like, important is data analytics, especially recently. So ha Hal Varians, the chief economist in, um, in Google, uh, say that statisticians will be the sexiest, jo sexi sexiest job in the 21st century. And um, this is a graph from Indeed.com showing the, like, the trends for job opportunities for data analyt analytics. Um, there's, a, there's a clear trends, uh, up trends, uh, same for data science. Uh, so this is really a hot topic these days. Um, you hear a, a lot about data science from many of the web companies. You hear about um, e-science, e you know, like do doing, like many sciences are like now shifting from querying the world to querying the data, things like oceanography, astronomy. And now the bottleneck is not the data. Collecting the data is easy. There is an abundance of the data collected, but analyzing the data, getting insights from the data. Okay, so to start with quick example, just to whet your appetite. Um, the pro you probably have seen this example before. So this is um, Google was able to predict the flu, the flu trend in the States uh, very accurately. So the, the, the blue line is Google prediction and the yellow line is the, um, like the numbers calculated by um, the US uh, Disease Control uh, Office. So you can see it's pretty accurate. Uh, and how Google did that, uh, it did that by analyzing the search log. So it looks, um, it, it, lo it, it analyzes uh, uh, the search log. So what people were searching for and focusing on terms related to flu and flu symptoms and other uh, like words that people would use to search for flu. Now the important point, so it's accurate, but the important point is that Google was able to do that much quicker than the US disease control uh, office because Google can do it in a real time. They just analyze the log. Uh, they have, while for the disease control office, they have to wait for all the data to be reported from all over the country and, uh, like, and analyzed in the central uh, office. So th this is a process that takes, I think, weeks or maybe months. Um, another example is um, Twitter. So um, like by analyzing tweets, people were able to predict change in stock markets and in some other contexts, like the revenue of movies and box offices. Um, last example. Um, and this is really cool. This is food. Uh, so a group of researchers took a large number of recipes. They look at the components of each recipes, the different flavors uh, of them, and by just by analyzing the data, um, they were able to like tell the differences between cuisine that comes from North America and that that comes from uh, East Asia. So this diagram in particular uh, shows that like um, North Americans would use a lot of milk, butter. Uh, while e East Asia will use so soy sauce, um, sesame oil, and then they look at the different combination of these flavors, um, and they, like, they, they just apply many scientific, uh, scientific methods on the recipes. Uh, and one of the like, results was that you, you, would, you might be able to come up with the recipes just by the data. You know, you'd say, okay, these two components go, go well together usually, so let's try, like, let's try them without really cooking, just like, you know, based on, based on the data. Um, I don't know how reliable is this, but that, that's like a research paper in, in nature, so um, it has some credibility. Okay, uh, now like the next question now that I've kind of tried to set the stage that data analytics is cool, data analytics is required, data analytics is useful. Um, so ca can, we use, can we do data analytics on top of RDF and do we really need to do that or is there a point in doing that? Um, and I'll start with the second question, like why should we use RDF for data analytics? Um, and you've, you have heard probably enough about RDF in these two days, uh, but I'll just, like there's no harm in reiterating. Um, so RDF is great for integrating data. You know, like you have many data sets popping over the web, um, like in different places. They all use the same data model. They all use the, the same, uh, uh, like kind of syntax, so you can very easily just pull this data together and analyze it. Um, so this should be very helpful in addressing the second V of the three Vs of big data, so which is the variety. So the variety in RDF data is not 
Kotlin com is not automatically solved, but it's kind of uh, the, all the data sets use the, the same data model and the same syntax, so you can kind of try to, uh, you, it's very easy to pull them together and work at, at a higher level of integrating them. Um, RDF is, is a graph data model which, is, which helps uh, uh, in expressing almost anything, and it has a, s a clearly defined semantics. So many of the terms that are used in RDF are clearly defined so that reasoning, inferencing can be done uh, like by machines. Um, so these are some of the reasons why we might want to, to do analytics on top of RDF. Um, now, the second question was, um, is there data in RDF? Is there like valuable, useful data that we can use to do the analytics? And um, yeah, the answer is um, yes, probably. And OK, the same picture again, uh, but now with some numbers. So this is the log cloud. Um, I think in 2000, uh, the numbers are from 2011. So it has more than thir 31 billion triples. So there's a huge number of factual information in the log cloud. Uh, there are like useful data sets such as uh, like, the, like the CIA fact book is there. Um, these are like basic information about um, countries and uh, uh, many many national census is also available as RDF data. Um, and now with the push towards schema.org from major search engines, you would expect the number like the the size of available RDF data to grow. Uh, so the data is there. But do we have the tools to analyze the data? Um, this is kind of a broad question, and I'll be just focusing on the standard SparkQL in this talk. Um, so SparkQL uh, for RDF is like SQL for relational database. So it's a query language, even very similar in, uh, uh, in syntax to SparkQL. Uh, the, uh, the, important, uh, the importance of using SparkQL is that it's the standardized way to, like, to make um, to query over RDF data. Many available data sets have already Sparkle endpoints. Um, so there is 427 uh, public Sparkle endpoints registered on Data Hub. So currently, um, you can just over the web query these, uh, uh, like just uh, send SparkQL queries and get the results back. And th it's a standardized syntax. It's a standa standardized interface. There is a large number of uh, available um, implementation, both commercial and open source. Um, and typically, when someone publishes RDF data, it's very probable that they will provide also a, a SparkQL endpoint. So uh, my argument is, if we can do RDF analytics using SparkQL, this means we can utilize the very large number of available data, data, data sets. Uh, but SparkQL, I'd say, like I said, it's very similar to SQL. So it's not really um, designed for analytics, but let's see how, how much we can push Sparkle or how much can we do with simple Sparkle queries to do analytics. Um, so in the next few uh, slides, I'll have some examples like uh, using Sparkle. Don't worry if you don't get the syntax, so it's not, this is not a tutorial about Sparkle. I'll just showing the, qu the queries here for completeness. Um, one more thing, I, I put all the queries online. So there's a link at the end. You can go and like uh, look at, at the details. But the point here is just to see how far can we go with SparkQL or what kind of analytics we can, we can do with a standard query language over RDF. And for, this, uh, for, for these, for these uh, example queries, I'll use a sample data set. So this, uh, this, these are photos of the speakers in this uh, conference. You would, yeah, you realize most of the faces uh, by now. Uh, so RDF data, you, you need to keep in mind that RDF data is a graph. So uh, you, you see like, you know, arrows, links between different uh, people. I just made these uh, randomly. So the, the arrows doesn't really mean uh, much. Um, I, I also intentionally kind of had two clusters of people. So these are people mo mostly from dairy and these are the others. Um, there's no real meaning just for the examples to make it uh, work with the examples. OK, so this is the data. And our plan is to see how, like, how SparkQL queries can help us like, make sense of the data or try to understand it. Um, so this is the first query. This is quite simple. Just give me all the names of the speakers. Super simple. You just get the name of the, of the people who, who are presenting. 
Um, now, a second, a second query, which looks like business intelligence queries. So these are queries that usually aggregate the data along some dimensions, and they are mostly used for reports and dashboards. This is like a very well-established area in the database. Um, so um, this query just calculates, like, kind of aggregates uh, the data and gives the number of speakers per gender. So we have two female speakers and eight male speakers. Um, if you just generalize this query or think of it uh, in a broader context, this means that with Sparkle you should be able to do, um, I'd say, all of the business intelligence typical queries, like things like crawl up and uh, drill down, so you can aggregate the data along different directions and get uh, get get measures and um, counts, sums, and this kind of stuff. Uh, so dashboards, analytical reports should be doable with SparkQL. Um, now let's try a different, like another query, very similar one, business intel business typical business intelligence query. Um, this query calculates the number of links that goes from each person. So how many, if you if you if you interpret this link as nodes, this is this query says okay for each of the speakers, tell me the number of people he knows, um, and you get the results. But if you think of it from a graph perspective, um, I don't know if you are familiar with the graph theory, but this is a measure that's known as the vertex out degree. And this is an important measure um, in, in graph. It gives you uh, the relative importance of, of a particular node. So how, how well connected is this person? Um, so that's cool, yeah? With, with, with simple, basic uh, BI queries, we can use we can do some graph uh, graph measures. So this is an example of the out degree. And um, yeah, as I said, this can be applied in a like broader context. For for example, in a social network, think Twitter or whatever. Yeah, you just heard from Lucas that sometimes you need to target people who are most influential. So one measure to do this is to see how how many numbers, how many followers that this user have. Um, and this this is an example of queries that can be used in this regard. If you think of an urban network, like a network of roads, this can see, like calculate the importance of a particular road, and then like decisions about doing maintenance for this road or whatever can be based on that. Um, okay, so looks like we can do some like some SparkQL queries to to calculate graph measures, and that that sounds cool and useful because like RDF data. One of the key differences from relational database is that it's a graph. So if the, if the query language allows you to make, like, to exploit this nature of the data, that should be very helpful. But can we push this kind of further? Can we, can we calculate the shortest path uh, of the graph? And this is also a very important uh, measure. Um, you know, if you have two nodes in the graph and you want to see, like, what's the, the shortest way to connect both of them. Um, if you think of social networks, if I want to contact some other person whom I don't know, and I want the shortest path to contact, so someone whom I know, whom in turn knows this uh, person, this is known as the shortest path uh, problem, and it's very helpful. So can we do this in SparkQL? Now, the short answer and the correct answer is no. And um, it's slightly, like, there's a slightly technical reason for that, but the current the current uh, specification of s uh, with the current specification of SparkQL, you can't do general like shortest path query. Uh, but yeah, like a longer answer is, th is that we can try. So if we if we are willing to do some just like some simplifications, we should be able to ca to calculate the shortest path between any two nodes in the graph. And these simplifications are uh, we have to name the type of the relation. So if you know what's the type of the relations, because in RDF, like, you know, each edge in this graph has a label, has a type. Uh, so you can't do a generic uh, shortest path calculation. But if you say, like, okay, I look at the homogeneous graph, I assume that all the links are nose relation, that someone knows the other person, then you ca and, and you put a maximum length on the shortest path. So it's like, okay, up to 100. I can't do you know, or up to 10. So if you know a bit about your graph, you should be able to calculate the shortest uh, path. Now, <coughs> this is the query. It's uh, slightly involved, slightly complicated, so you don't need to worry about the details. I had it uh, online, but you see what, like, this calculates only up to three. So if you want to have it up to 100, you have to 
like repeat this one 100 times. So you can do shortest path queries if you are willing to do some, uh, some simplifications. Um, and this is an example of applying this query on the sample data we have, the set of speakers. Um, so it gives you all the speakers. Now, yeah, this shows the URI is not the names, uh, but you can tell the names. So uh, between Anna and Lucas, for example, the shortest path in that graph involves four hops. So they're kind of uh, far from each other. Like, why, like Anna, Jan, it's only one. Um, so as I said, this is an important, um, this is an important measure uh, in, in graph theory, and this is like a number of uh, applications this can be applied in. Um, so I, I made these examples available online. Um, I kind of like, I ha you have the data there and you have the Spark UL queries where you can uh, apply it. There are like, there are, I have a link at the end, and there are a number of more queries you can try. So there is the average degree over the graph, uh, things like um, spreading activation over the graph, you can do these things over Spark UL. It's kind of uh, involved and might take too long time, so I don't have them in the slide, but you can check them online. Uh, but one other application I'd like to talk about in this is like a clustering. Uh, so, so far, what we've done is that uh, we took like uh, basic analytics. Can we do uh, BI, like business intelligence, like uh, queries using Spark UL? And the answer is yes. Then we kind of pushed it a bit and talked about doing basic graph measures. And we say like, okay, yeah, maybe we can do for many of the cases. Uh, so can we push this, this further and have like data, like algorithm from data mining? Can we do clustering using only the standard, uh, the standard Spark UL? And um, the answer is yes, but this is not a general yes, but like there are algorithms that can be uh, implemented purely in Spark UL. Um, and an example is uh, what's called peer pressure clustering algorithm. So maybe I should say a couple of words about clustering. Uh, clustering a graph is just grouping no nodes that are similar. Uh, so it's an algorithm that will tell you, okay, this set of nodes seems similar to each other. This is set of nodes so that you don't have to deal with m one million nodes in the graph, but you can deal with few groups. Um, the peer pressure algorithm in, in particular for each node, looks at its neighbors and choose the most common, um, the most common category or group, and assign it to the node. So it's a way to, to to cluster nodes together. I took this example from Yark Data Blog, so they had an implementation for uh, for a for a peer pressure clustering algorithm using Spark UL. Um, yeah, again, the Spark UL query is kind of involved, it's just behind the the table. But this is the result of running it uh, uh, over the data, the sample data I have. And it, it performs relatively well. So this is, if you look at the names, these are the people from Dairy. And for some reason, the, the, second, uh, the second cluster was identified as two clusters. Uh, but the bottom line is that, yes, you can do clustering algorithms. And this clustering algorithm is an, import, is an example of iterative algorithms. So algorithms that keep calculating same thing till it converges. Um, and it's doable in Spark UL. Uh, if you think, pro like, um, if you take clustering in general, there is there is a large number of cool applications. So this is this is just a quick example about clustering students in a school. Um, and the researchers who did this um, identified four clusters. It's like one, two, three, four, and that's based on gender and based on um, ethnicity. So these are like uh, white girls, white boys, uh, black boys, black girls, and this is kind of alarming, you know, you see like all the interactions between students are very much associated, like c limited by gender and by male. Okay, so to move on, um, so in summary, uh, can we do business intelligence-like operations in Sparkle? Yes. Can we do graph measures? Almost. Can we do iterative algorithms? O almost, because uh, we, we were able to do it for uh, peer pressure uh, clustering. Not sure if we can do with every algorithm. And one more thing, this wasn't really a pure Spark UL because you need some, some script just to keep calculating the same Spark UL query because this is how iterative algorithms work. And Spark UL, like, like SQL, there's no loops there. So you need some extra code that just keep, uh, keep executing the Spark UL. Okay, so I'm, I'm almost finished. This is the one. 
like the, the one before the last slide. Um, and this is, looks like, OK, this sounds cool, but I, I like, performed everything on the sample data which I have, which is really small. Um, and the important question, does this scale? Um, and it's really ha hard to answer, because like, scalability is not a SparkQL only issue, but it's an implementation issue. But given the existing implementation, uh, one way to scale, uh, one way to scale SparkQL execution is to use MapReduce-like and Hadoop-like um, uh, architecture. So these like sca called scale-out uh, parallel computation engine, and this is the logo of Hadoop. In case uh, doesn't look familiar, um, so there is there is a, a number of existing works which goes into two strands, translating SparkQL queries to MapReduce, and this should scale like as. As you are able to put more machines, you can like you know scale the computation, or you can directly uh, process the RDF data in MapReduce. So you don't have to start with SparkQL. You can treat this graph as somehow like tabular or relational uh, data or some key value pairs, and perform the the same calculation. Um, there is there is a language called Pig Latin, so it's just language that translates to MapReduce, just an easy way to, uh, to write uh, MapReduce. Uh, and I'm mentioning it because I have translated all the queries you see in the, s in the, in the slides into Big Latin, and it's also online, so you can have a look. Um, it's usually long and involved, but it scales. So it's, it's an expressivity versus scalability trade-off. OK, just concluding. Um, can we do data science uh, using RDF? Well, do we have the data? Yes, there's, there's the data there. Do we have the tools? Probably almost. So we have tools. They might not be very usable. They might not scale. But we can, we, to a certain degree, we can, we can do many calculations. Um, um, yeah, as I said, all the examples are available at this link. And um, that's it. Thank you. Uh, I'm happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you for sharing, Fadi. Uh, now I open it for questions. Um, in one of your slides, I saw some uh, SQL queries for calculating the graph measures. Uh, have you considered or have you uh, looked into operational research methods for calculating uh, the paths between uh, different nodes? Yeah. OK, um, and no, I didn't look before, but now thinking of it. Um, so I guess most of the, the, these myth methods will be like an iterative algorithms. I might be wrong, but something that you need to keep kind of running. So you can do a single calculation in SparkQL, but then you need, you need, you need an extra driver you know, to uh, to keep running this till it converges or till it finished. Um, now, the problem is that SparkQL is declarative, so you can't have a sequence of steps. You can't easily have a sequence of steps. So there's no SparkQL itself. There's no variables you can assign. There's no loops. There's no recursion. There is user-defined functions, but they, OK, they're not very easy to add. Uh, OK, so. Um, I don't know exactly how hard it will be. I, I, I guess it will be uh, because, yeah, I, I, my guess is that like, these algorithms need a sequence of steps. And then when you want to put them in, in, in a declarative one query, um, yeah, it might be challenging. I can't say if it's doable or not. For many of the algorithms, like uh, the one I show, you can find a way. Usually, it's slightly hard, and the results of the queries are not easily understandable. So. It's, it's a trade-off. You, you use the standard. You can use any data sets there, like that has a sparkle endpoint. But then you lose maybe on the performance and on the um, like, user, like ease of use. Uh, maybe there are some ways to, to try to implement, to try to integrate SparkQL uh, uh, with those methods and to optimize uh, the search and uh, the algorithm. Yeah, sure. I mean, this is something worth looking at. <laughs> Cheers, thanks. Do we have other questions? 
Um, if you wanted to assess the quality of your answers to business intelligence queries, what would you have to know? What would you have to do? Okay, um, you mean like particularly to Spark QL? Yeah, uh, simply reliability of the, of the answers if you know something about your data sources. Yeah, okay. Um, so first of all, like the context of applying business intelligence queries are mostly uh, like w probably within enterprise. Uh, so f you might have better control over the data. Um, so the data, Y you need to know something about, like you need to know the dimensions of the data and what, how exactly you want to slice the data and what exactly you need to aggregate. Um, this is okay. This is similar to what you have in SQL. Now, for SparkQL itself, like all the BI, all the support for the BI queries is just part of the, like the very recent version of SparkQL, which is 1.1. Uh, there is a number of implementations uh, that support these uh, these kind of queries. Uh, they are not as mature as the like previous uh, features of SparkQL. So, performance-wise, probably, yeah, these queries won't execute as well as SQL would would be. Uh, but in terms of expressivity, I I believe everything that you can express in like SQL for like crawl up and drill down queries, like for for reports and aggregates, can be expressed in. Uh, in SparkQL. Performance, probably not as good now because the technology is not as mature. Uh, do you need to know the data? Yes, you need to, to know exactly what dimensions you need to slice the data. About. There was a question. So what's the key one feature that's missing from Sparkle or that would have to be added to Sparkle to make it more useful as a, as a language for analytics? Okay. Uh, <coughs> Yeah, well, uh, like one uh, one argument is that SparkQL itself, as it stands, okay, that's my own uh, kind of point of view, is not the language to do uh, to do analytics. Now it exists; it's widely supported; it's implemented, widely implemented. So it makes sense to make use of it, and people are familiar with it. But to really uh, to really do do analytics, uh, you you need a way to express more. Uh, um, like like richer algorithm, like you need a way to define a set of steps, a set of steps that goes one after another. You need some control of flow, so you need like if else and loops, which you can't easily do them in a single SparkQL query because it's a declarative language. You can't pin down how exactly the execution will be. Um, so yeah, I don't think there is a particular feature that you add to SparkQL and then it's great for analytics. Uh, my take on it is that. Uh, it's a great to reuse as much of Sparkle as possible, but in probably a different language, which is more like a hybrid language where you have you have a sequence, like a script-like language, but uh, the syntax is of Sparkle is intuitive, is known to people, and uh, you can use these parts, but in slightly different context. Okay, thank you. <coughs>